Today, we're delighted to have another lady who's achieved a remarkable amount in China. Uh, Leita Hong Fincher is a former journalist who is now uh, completing a doctorate in sociology at Tsinghua University in Beijing. Uh, Leita is going to talk about leftover women, the resurgence of gender inequality in China. Over to you, Leita. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Timothy Huxley, for, and the Foreign Correspondents Club for hosting me today. And thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, it, it's been really great to see a couple of some people from Beijing from years ago. And thanks for coming. <laughs> um, so I wanted to keep this quite short, uh, because it, usually there are a lot of interesting questions. And um, so the book is very wide ranging. So let me just get to it, and then we can get to the questions as quickly as possible. Um, so leftover women is the term that was defined by the official All China Women's Federation in 2007 to mean an educated urban woman over the age of 27 who is still single. And ever since the Women's Federation defined that term, um, China's Ministry of Education also adopted it as part of China's official lexicon. Um, and that year, the Chinese state media began very aggressively pushing the term through all sorts of news reports, columns, commentaries, and cartoons. So I thought for today it would be useful to show you some of the cartoons. Um, and I'm going to start with um, some subcategories of so-called leftover women, as defined by the People's Daily. Um, they did a survey uh, nationwide in 2010 on attitudes to love and marriage. And they used the headline, see which category of leftover you belong to. The first category was women aged 25 to 27 years old, called sheng dou shi, which I translated as leftover fighters. These are women who still have the courage to fight for a partner. So if you look at the cartoon there, this is, by the way, just a tiny drop in an ocean of very insulting images and language about single educated women. Um, and the themes are very similar. So, the woman in this cartoon has a mortarboard on her head indicating that she's graduated from university. She's wearing thick rimmed glasses showing that she's been a bookworm, she's been very focused on her studies, and she's very sloppily dressed underneath her white wedding gown. Notice she's wearing jeans and sneakers as she chases the winged Cupid. Um, so the the implication is that she's been studying too hard and she hasn't been focusing on the right thing, which is finding a good husband. So time is running out for her. Here are some more pictures from this category. On the left, it says, leftover women, should I persevere or should I compromise? And on the right, you have a young woman, again, wearing thick rimmed glasses showing that she's a bookworm. She's been excessively focused on her own education. She's turning 27, and the candles are already melting. Cobwebs are growing around her. And gathering on the roof above her is snow, so she's being frozen out. And the smoke coming out of the chimney forms the character Jiong, which is a new Chinese character meaning extremely frustrated or depressed. And the caption says, I barely feel that I've grown up, but all of a sudden I've been conspicuously left over. The second subcategory of leftover women is women aged 28 to 30 years old, bi sheng ke, or the ones who must triumph. A uh, quote from the People's Daily, their careers leave them no time for the hunt. Notice that this woman, again, is wearing the mortarboard, so she's highly educated. She graduated from university, and she's wearing the white wedding gown, but there's no 
man in the groom suit uh, because she's been too focused on furthering her career. Now, I might add that um, all of the uh, negative language, the in extremely insulting language and images um, are kind of a reflection of the tremendous educational gains of Chinese women over the past decade. So in the 2010 census, the number of college-educated women exceeded uh, by 13 percentage points the number of college-educated women from a decade earlier. So there have been tremendous gains in uh, the numbers of Chinese women who are able to graduate from university. And these women are also outperforming men in university. So, um, so this is why I, I argue that when you're looking at these images and you, you analyze the news reports and the in insulting language, what you're seeing is really a backlash against the recent tremendous educational gains of women in the mainland. So let's look at a few more cartoons. Um, this is another very common quote. Don't be so picky, just get married. Um, the woman on the right is very stubbornly turning down all these marriage proposals from perfectly respectable men. Uh, she says, I want to find a perfect man. So she's being very stubborn. Her, she's setting her sights too high. She refuses to compromise. So that's why she's still single, according to the state media, because her standards are too high. She refuses to lower her standards in looking for a partner. This quote is really worth reading. Um, this is from the Xinhua News Agency, and it had the headline, Do Leftover Women Deserve Our Sympathy? Um, pretty girls don't need a lot of education to marry into a rich and powerful family, but girls with an average or ugly appearance will find it difficult. These kinds of girls hope to further their education in order to increase their competitiveness. The tragedy is they don't realize that as women age, they are worth less and less. So by the time they get their MA or PhD, they are already old, like yellowed pearls. Now, this Xinhua News column was reposted on the Women's Federation website just days after International Women's Day on 2000, uh, in 2011. So the next subcategory of leftover women is women aged 31 to 35 years old. Doujian Shengfu, or Buddha of Victorious Battles, a play on the ancient legend of the Monkey King. And I quote from uh, Xinhua News, high-level leftover women battle to survive in the cruel workplace but are still single. So if you look at the image here, this is another common theme that you see in the cartoons and the language. Um, the women are perched above the men, and they're looking for their dream partner. Um, but they don't notice the masses of men beneath them. And, and these masses of men are, are a, a reference to China's extreme sex ratio imbalance. So according to official statistics, there are about 20 million more men under the age of 30 than women under the age of 30. And that's the prime marrying age. So um, the rhetoric, again, is that these women, if they simply lowered their standards and weren't so picky about who they married, they would find it's very easy because there are plenty of men to choose from. Um, and notice that the women been, are standing on um, this platform that says high income, high professional position, and high education. These are the three highs, <laughs> um, the San Gao, which shows the targeting of this leftover women term specifically at urban educated women. Um, again, a quote from the state media, finding a partner should be as easy as blowing away a speck of dust. If you look at the image on the left, again, the woman is wearing thick rimmed glasses showing her excessive devotion to her own studies. And she's in this high tower, again, perched above the shadowy masses of men beneath her. 
another oblique reference to the millions of surplus men in China's population. And on this castle that she's in, again, it says high education, high professional position, high income. And in the caption, she says, why has my Prince Charming not appeared yet? If I keep waiting any longer, this Snow White will turn into an old witch. So, uh, and on the right, it's, uh, it's another woman with a mortar board on her head, highly educated. She's made a lot of money. She's very successful, but note that she has no man. The final category of leftover women is women aged 35 and older, qi tian da sheng, or great sage equal of heaven. She has, quote, a luxury apartment, private car, and a company. So why did she become a leftover woman? And if you look at this image, the uh, crown that she wears on her head says sheng nu, but the sheng is actually a homonym for sheng meaning leftover. And here they've used the character meaning holy or saintly. So the implication is that this woman has made it to the top of the career ladder by brutally slaying the men beneath her. You see they lie bloodied and dead at her feet, and blood is dripping off the sword. Um, beneath her are the three other subcategories of leftover women that I just outlined um, that are widely thrown about in the state media. So uh, she's made it to the top of the career ladder, but she's destined to just be sexless and alone because she's focused too much on her career. She's been too ambitious. She's ignored the much more important goal of finding a good husband. Another quote from the state media. It is only when they have lost their youth and are kicked out by the man that they decide to look for a life partner. So if you look at the cartoon on the left, this woman has just graduated from university. She's clutching her diploma, and she's standing again above the men beneath her, um, but she's battered by these cold winds and snow, and her eyes are bulging with fright or terror. Um, and the caption on this uh, platform she's standing on says urban educated woman seeks marriage. Um, but the men beneath her note that they're very warmly dressed. The blizzard is not affecting them. And the guy on the left says, she's too highly educated. The guy on the right says, she's too capable. So they have no interest in marrying her because she's simply too successful and well-educated. And on the right, well, um, this is just your typical single, miserable boss woman who has made it to the top of the career ladder and the men are just cowering before her because she's clearly angry because she doesn't have a man in her life. So where did this term, actually I should really wrap up. Uh, <laughs> I wanna open it to, up to questions, but uh, briefly before opening it up, I found out that just before the Chinese state media began really aggressively pushing the leftover women term, that the state council issued a major population decision to address so-called unprecedented population pressures. And it said, quote, the low quality of the general population makes it hard to meet the requirements of fierce competition for national strength. And it's stated as a key goal that China needs to upgrade population quality, or su zhi. Um, so I argue that basically uh, one of the reasons why the state media has been pushing this term for years, it's still doing it today, seven years later, is because it wants to pressure these women who are educated, who are naturally wanting to delay marriage to pursue their careers, um, it's trying to scare them, intimidate them into lowering their standards and marrying fast before they get uh, so-called too old to find a man. So I want to open it up to questions there. So um, please, anybody? Yes? 
Uh, thank you, Leita. Um, I think that pretty yielded a stunned silence from many people, but quite remarkable. Uh, let's straight open to questions. Uh, there are microphones that will be brought to you. Uh, and uh, when uh, you're picked out, could you just uh, identify yourself and uh, oh, your affiliation? About, uh... Uh, I saw, Ted, you had your hand gesticulating vigorously. Uh, Ted Thomas, um, I'm a publisher, long-term member of this club, and at the risk of upsetting a lot of my friends, I have to say it's the most magnificent speech I've heard here for years. Thank you. That's very kind of you. You've all, also got a very good point, uh, but my own understanding was that an excess of men in uh, China because of the... the, um, the um, government's policy of getting rid of young girls before they're even born. Well, you've made some very good points, and I have to say that any man in his right mind who isn't uh, sending you a bunch of flowers after this uh, is missing out. Thank you. Oh, well, <laughs> very nice of you Thank to you. say that. Uh, <laughs> uh, Joyce, on table here. I'm, I'm Joyce Lau. Is this on? Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm Joyce Lau. Okay, I think we, we can all agree this is pretty insulting towards women, but do you think this is insulting towards Chinese men? Because uh, in all these cartoons, they look like a bunch of losers. Like, they can't, they can't get a date, they can't get a job, they're uneducated, they're falling over bloodied. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, the guy aspect? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and it is. It's a perpetuation of gender stereotypes. So the message is that sent by the state media is that women have got to marry by their late 20s or they're never going to find a man. In fact, the People's Daily says that over 90% of men in China say that a woman must marry before she turns 27 or she will be unwanted. Now, basically, that's a complete myth. Chinese men are not so stupid and sexist. I mean, some of them are. But um, another myth is, yeah, that they're perpetuating myths about men as well as women. Um, so the sex ratio imbalance is, is, is a big problem for the country. Um, but the, these surplus men that are widely talked about tend to be rural and uneducated. So when you look at the big cities, um, there, some economists argue that the sex ratio imbalance means that women should have the upper hand in the marriage market. But I've found in my research that with regard to big cities at least, such as Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, and Shenzhen, that that's simply not true. Um, and I don't think I have time to get into the other aspect of my research, which is the creation of a tremendous gender wealth gap through China's real estate boom. Um, but if anybody's interested, you can ask. Um, yes, but it does, the, the media representations are very insulting to men and women. Over in the corner here, please. Uh, yeah, my name is Susan Finder. I work for Practical Law China, which is a subsidiary of Thomson Reuters. Uh, my question is, um, how far up the policy ladder does this, you know, is this, is there a Central Committee of the Communist Party document on this? And I think, you know, a lot of, some of the leader, like Xi Jinping has a daughter, right? So. Right. Yeah, so can you yeah. Put, yeah, put, you, put your, your laser light right. up there? You know, um, I did not study, I did not attempt to interview government officials in my research. Um, my research just, I don't want to get bogged down in the methodology, but um, I started out by conducting an ethnography of real estate firms in Beijing. And then um, China amended its marriage law in 2011 um, to state, I don't to state that uh, basically if your name is not on the property deed and you get a divorce, you 
forfeit your claim to the home. And um, anecdotally, I've spoken to lawyers um, who have some knowledge about why the amendment was made. And they say that uh, the Supreme Court was deluged by letters from parents of sons who had saved their whole lives to buy a home for their son because of the widely perpetuated myth that the man has to own a home in order to attract a bride. Again, that's a total myth based on my research, and not just my research, um, Horizon Research, is, which is a big market research firm. They conducted a study in 2012 of China's four biggest real estate markets, Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, and Shenzhen. They found that women contributed to over 70% of uh, homes purchased on the private market. And yet only 30% of these homes contained, included women's names on the deed. Um, so, and the vast majority of homes, according to a nationwide survey conducted in 2012, um, the vast majority of homes in China are still registered solely in men's names. And that goes for both married men and single men. Um, so, as you see here, I, I say a couple of brief points is that um, parents tend to buy homes for sons and not for daughters. Women often transfer their life savings over to the man to finance the purchase of a marital home, but they forfeit ownership of the home by leaving their name off the deed. This is very complicated, and I can't get into all of the factors now, but one of the reasons I identified was that this new campaign since 2007, the telling women who are educated and successful that they are basically spoiled goods, they're like rotten food over the age of 27, is really being internalized, unfortunately, by a lot of these young women. And so the women, even though they really want their names on the property deed, they often just back down under the pressure from e e extraordinary social, economic, and regulatory forces. Uh, so I argue that women have basically been shut out of what is the largest accumulation of residential property wealth in history, which is worth over 30 trillion US dollars. Hi, Elaine Pickering. I think I'm a great sage, equal of heaven and rotten fruit. That's how I would describe myself. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, a lot of the questions I had have been answered already. But um, so I'll ask: What role has social media played in this? I mean, what have the com have you looked at that? What have the comments been about? about yes. That? Well, social media played a large role in my research, actually. Um, because after I did the ethnographic study of Beijing real estate companies, that's the first part of my research, then I noticed that there were very strong gender norms. The norm was that the man is supposed to be the homeowner. And I, and I noticed that there were women leaving their names off the deeds. And, um, and then when China amended its marriage law in August of 2011, I started a Weibo account. And I asked people to take part in my survey. So I have a total sample of 283 people from across China, men and women. Um, so, so I conducted the first part of my research through Weibo. And then I followed it up with in-depth interviews, personal interviews with 60 people. But social media plays a large role in uh, propagating uh, these very sexist messages coming from the propaganda department. And getting back to your question, um, it's really a, a whole bunch of agencies, um, starting with the State Council population decision that was issued in 2007. The State Council, when it said that China must upgrade population quality, it named the Women's Federation as one of the agencies to implement this, but it also named the Public Security Bureau and the Ministry of Civil Affairs. Um, and the Women's Federation has played a particularly strong role in organizing mass matchmaking events that are deliberately targeting urban educated women and men. Um, and the reports on these match, mass matchmaking events 
are, or, or anything really, in the state media are widely circulated through social media. Um, and you notice that in recent years, the Chinese government, all sorts of agencies of the Chinese government have started their own official Weibo accounts. So propaganda today has become much more sophisticated than it used to be. Um, and yes, there are proliferation of alternative voices, but I really think that in many ways, the internet and this mastery of social media on the part of the Chinese government has actually magnified the voice of the official government um, through propaganda. Community property, community property laws in China. Uh, that, that's an astonishing thing about women often transfer assets to husband and boyfriend to finance to purchase. Okay, let's say there's a living together, but let's say they're married. And of course, there's also into the older generation, the so-called minor wife problem too, which complicates things. But let's just talk about normal nuclear couple situation. Aren't they protected automatically by some degree of community property statutes? Well, they used to be. Um, after the Communist Revolution in 1950, China uh, created this marriage law, which was a cornerstone of the Communist Revolution. And it gave women all sorts of new rights, including the right to own their own property, the right to divorce. Um, and, and then, of course, there was the collectivization of property years later, which kind of made the private property issue moot. Um, but then in, in 1980 and onwards, with mar the onset of market reforms, the marriage law underwent a series of amendments, which actually strengthened women's rights to marital property through the idea of common, uh, common marital property. But that has basically been undone by the new amendment in 2011, which now says that if your name is not on the deed, you don't own the property. Um, and there are some people who say that this law is gender neutral, because it doesn't say women have no claim to the property. Um, it says that if women contribute to the purchase of the marital home, then by law they're entitled to uh, a refund of the amount that they contributed to the purchase of the home. So you have to produce a receipt, a financial document, showing how much money you contributed to that home. But this idea that a woman has to produce a legal receipt to document her contribution to the household and the marriage is inherently sexist. First of all, I didn't encounter a single woman in my research who kept receipts of how much money she contributed from her salary to the partnership. Moreover, this completely discounts the contribution of women who don't work for pay. And this is a lot of women who, you know, they give birth to a child, they take time out from work, um, they're certainly contributing to the marriage and the household, but uh, under the new amendment to the law, these women are not contributing financially. So, and, and of course, there are a lot of holes in China's legal system. Essentially, there is no rule of law. So, um, so in my book, I, I kind of outline all the different ways in which women who are trying to assert their rights in marriage, their rights to property, um, protections against abusive husbands, these women are basically left with no recourse. Yes, over in the corner there, please. Hi, Shalini Mitani. Thank you, that was really informative. Um, there are many women who choose not to get married for, for many reasons. And one group of women who choose not to get married perhaps are lesbians. So I'm interested to hear from you what, if anything, has this done to the movement of, of lesbians in, in China? Thank yeah. you. Yeah. That's a very important point. Um, first of all, it's very interesting to me when I was interviewing feminist activists, um, particularly in Beijing, to find out how many of them were lesbian. 
And some of the activists that I interviewed said that this is because uh, the, if you're a lesbian, it kind of opens up all sorts of possibilities for you as a woman. Um, and if, if you're heterosexual, then you're more bound by all of these traditional norms. So that's kind of interesting. But it's not only lesbians who are choosing to stay single. The fact is that um, there are heterosexual women who are so angry about the gender discrimination um, and all sorts of new forms of sort of systemic gender equality, inequality, um, including the leftover women campaign, the, uh, the reversal of married women's property rights um, in 2011, the fact that China still hasn't passed targeted legislation against domestic violence in spite of over a decade of intense lobbying on the part of women's NGOs and feminist activists. So there are heterosexual women who say, I refuse to ever get married because marriage as an institution in China is bad for women. Um, and one woman told me that the most rational choice is to stay single. So there are definitely women who are choosing to stay single. Um, and and in, in part, I think that this is why the Chinese government is so concerned about hammering away at this message that uh, to, to women who will believe the message um, that they're never going to be able to find a husband if they leave it to too late. And, and I need to point out as well that these strong messages, these insulting messages sent by the state media are not just targeting the young, educated women. They're equally, or maybe even more, targeting the women's parents and elders because the direct pressure on women to marry comes from their parents and elders. So a lot of the rhetoric in the media is telling parents, don't let up on nagging your daughter. Um, in fact, one of, the, one of the interesting Xinhua News reports I read uh, pointed to Japan and said, well, look at this Japanese father. He lets his daughter do whatever he, she wants, and he doesn't pressure her to marry. But in the end, Japan has a demographic crisis, crisis and a shrinking population. So we don't want China to go down that road. Um, so the, the propaganda is aimed just as much at the parents and elders and then they use the parents and elders to pressure the daughters. Over on the side here. Um, I was wondering, you know, this propaganda is obviously very offensive, but you see things like uh, the Tiny Times films, which are immensely popular in China. Um, I mean, how many women did you meet in the course of your research that were highly educated and did want to get married and that was this ever like representational of any of the women that you met? I'm sorry, how many women did want to get married? Yeah, that, that were looking for husbands, but literally just said, you know, like, I'm, I'm picky and like, I don't want to settle for uneducated oh. or, or, I mean, does, did that ever come up? Like, I'm asking in your research. Yes, I mean, there are women who, well, first of all, the, this, this term picky is also sexist. I mean, no, I'm, I'm picky. I mean, I, I think anyone can be picky. I, well, but, I, I didn't. The, I didn't mean yeah. for women. I mean, just that they they have standards that. Yes. I mean, everyone has standards. Well, yes, there are definitely women who are uh, holding or standing firm and refusing to compromise and just marry any old person. Um, and you know, as I said, there are some women who say they refuse to ever get married. But unfortunately, right now. What really disturbed me in my research was the how many incredibly intelligent, highly educated young women who really have the world as their oyster, and they've, they've had really successful careers ever since they left college or they got their master's degrees. How many of them still fall prey to these damaging state media messages? And then they rush into marriage with the wrong guy because the pressure to marry is so intense. And they just end up giving up. Um, 
and this is very disturbing to me, and, and that's partly why you know I really, I, I like giving talks in Chinese in the mainland because I want to <laughs> tell these young women, don't believe this. Uh, men are not that sexist, actually. They're not as sexist as they're made out to appear by the state media. You're not going to die alone and miserable. And even if you are single for the rest of your life, well, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but the, the statistics to date show that women are still marrying at a rather young age compared to areas surrounding China. And I think that, um, including Hong Kong, I, I think that the Chinese government is looking at the demographics around China, seeing more and more educated women in places like Taiwan, Japan, South Korea, Singapore, even Hong Kong, delaying marriage. Um, and see, they see this as a big problem because they need these educated women, from their point of view, to be having babies for the future of the country. Hi, uh, Angie Zhang, thanks for your talk, Lita. Um, uh, I think you rightly pointed out the fact that, you know, as insulting as these comics are, they are some myths that are promulgated in the household, right? These are things you hear from your grandmother because of the importance of family and traditional Chinese culture. Um, so I was wondering if you were able to distinguish how much of these myths are government manufactured by the propaganda department to, um, to, 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 to really pressure these women, or whether it's sort of like a more organic, um, these reporters are reporting what they hear at home, and it's sort of like a cultural phenomenon. So if you're able to distinguish yeah. those two. That's a very important question, because certainly throughout Chinese history, marriage was always important. And there was always pressure to get married. The difference is, you look at what's been happening in the past decade, that women have made extraordinary gains in education, and their gender norms are much more progressive now. So naturally, these young, educated, extremely intelligent, talented women naturally want to marry at an older age because they want to focus on furthering their careers. So their parents, um, and, and I've certainly anecdotally heard, that there are parents who are more inclined to just accept that their daughter, it's okay for the daughter to marry later, but then this is where the propaganda comes in. Because the propaganda is so intense, there's a barrage on a daily basis of propaganda saying that these women have got to get married by their late 20s or no man will want them. It tends to be the older generation that really believes that. And so, I think that this, the propaganda plays a large role in, in continuing to push these retrograde gender beliefs. And if it weren't for the propaganda, you would naturally see that the marriage age of women just rising, just as it has in other countries. And, and it's because of the power of the one-party state and its monopoly on information, that it's able to hammer away at this message. And the women have few alternative sources of information that are more empowering to them. Thank you very much for the talk, uh, Genevieve Hilton. I'd like to know what if you have any insight on what this um, topic of improving the quality of the population might actually mean. Because when I, when I saw that on your screen, I thought, hell, it sounds like eugenics. But is, am I jumping to conclusions, or what is, it, what it is, is that eugenics. all about? Um, it is eugenics, and in fact, China, the thing about Chinese population planning is that it is not only about controlling the quantity of the population through things like policies like the one-child policy. It is equally about controlling the quality. This has been a very strong part of population planning for many years. And eugenics is not, as a, a notion, is not nearly as controversial in China as it is in other countries. And in fact, um, before 1995, there was a law called the eugenics law, um, which is 
now been renamed, well not now, it was in 1995, renamed the Maternal and Infant Health Law. Um, and it's directed at controlling the number of women who have birth defects. Um, and so that's another element of the propaganda, is that it's not just that uh, it says that women who wait too long till past their late 20s will never find a husband. It's also that women, if you wait too long, you'll pass your best childbearing years and you're gonna have a baby with a birth defect. And this is a very big element of the propaganda as well. Um, and you'll see things like the People's Daily uh, with a headline, you know, uh, numbers of birth defects in Beijing have increased dramatically in recent years. And the first, uh, the first sentence in the report will say, due to the increasing number of women giving birth at an older age, the number of birth defects has increased dramatically. But you rarely see reports linking the rising number of birth defects with China's extraordinary environmental degradation, which is the actual cause of the rise in birth defects. It's simply unscientific. So they're using the rise in birth defects, again, to scare women into thinking, oh my god, I have to get married before I turn 30, or I'm going to have a baby with a birth defect. I think we have time for one more question. And just in the front there. Hi, thank you very much. My name's Kate. Um, I think there must be something very wrong with me, because I, th I don't find this at all surprising. Um, <clears throat> maybe it's because I come from uh, London, where they have the Daily Mail, which spouts this sort of stuff <laughs> 12 times a day. Um, I suppose you would speak very passionately, um, and uh, I, I wonder what, what is so surprising about this for you, because there are a couple of things here which are actually true. Um, you know, wherever you come from in the world, if you, there are lots and lots of perfectly educated women who do want to get married and do want to have children and they get to their late 30s or even their mid 30s and they find that actually they have left it too late, be that to find the right guy or a guy or to have children. Um, anecdotally, I know many, many women like that. So isn't this just kind of a normal progression as women become more educated, the rest of the world starts getting all upset about it and really they're just focusing their attention. They're like, if you do leave it too late to have children, it will become more difficult. If you do leave it too late to choose a man, it will become more difficult. Perhaps it is a good idea to settle. Mm -hmm. I agree the language is appalling, um, but is the sentiment really that shocking? Uh, well, the thing is, I suppose you would have to ask you know, the women concerned, um, because yes, there, I mean, I certainly know, I mean, I happen to be married, but I certainly have a lot of single friends who are in their 40s, and they haven't found the right guy. But there's not really a big problem there. I mean, it's a, if they want to get married, they can get married. If they want to lower their standards, lower their standards. But um, it's not just me. I found um, that when I speak to young Chinese women in the mainland, I get... A, quite an enthusiastic response because they didn't realize that this is an orchestrated propaganda campaign to make them really afraid that they have to lower their standards. They have to marry a guy even though they don't love him because otherwise they're never going to get married. But is that really such a terrible fate to be a single woman? In fact, my book outlines all sorts of cases of absolutely horrifying marriages where, and, and domestic violence is an incredibly terrible epidemic in China that is really underreported. There are very, very few women who are willing to, next to none, except for an American woman, Kim Lee, who are willing to go public about um, this extreme abuse at the hands of their husbands. And they have no recourse. But the, the, because of the intense propaganda, and the propaganda affects extended family members, they mobilize parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles and other friends to put pressure on these young women to get married. 
And then they push them into bad marriages because these women don't know the guy. And they, they seem to think that getting married is you know, going to be uh, much, much better, even if the guy, they don't know him at all. So, um, so I mean, yeah, maybe that's, uh, that's your point of view. Um, but I, I, I want to just point out the fact that this is an orchestrated state campaign and that women actually have other paths open to them in life. And that in, through my research, I found that single women tend to fare much better in China because they avoid getting trapped into these extremely unequal financial arrangements in marriage that leave them trapped in often abusive relationships and that leave them you know, <laughs> impoverished, that they've transferred their life savings over to a man and, then they, uh, and the marriage doesn't work out. Right, well, that brings us uh, to the close. Uh, thank you very much. I think that's been one of the most uh, interesting, educational, uh, and uh, possibly life-defining for all of us speeches that we've had here for a long time. Lisa, thank you very much. Thank you.